The Value of Debt in Building Wealth by Thomas J. Anderson. Americans have learned to regard debt with deep suspicion. But people should consider their finances the way companies run their balance sheets. Money you invest at age 30 or 40 can grow substantially by the time you reach retirement age. By skipping retirement contributions to pay debt, you reap the benefit of retiring debt-free, but forego the potentially larger gain of decades of compounded returns. Among the three types of debt, oppressive debt, such as credit card balances, is the worst. Working debt, such as mortgages, student loans and business loans, is acceptable if it helps you buy something valuable that you couldn't otherwise afford. Enriching debt is a loan that you take by choice because it will make you wealthier. If you pay 3% on a mortgage and earn 6% by investing the money, you're getting richer. Aggressive, high-risk investing makes sense only after you've built considerable wealth. Homeownership comes with many hidden expenses, and it isn't always the wisest move. Summary. Debt is not all bad. Many financially savvy Americans regard debt with deep suspicion. Credit card balances and payday loans are losers' games, according to financial gurus like Dave Ramsey and Suze Orman. This advice is accurate as far as it goes. You'll never achieve financial stability by overspending or by paying usurious interest rates on consumer debt. But you could consider a more nuanced view of borrowing, one that combines the concept of good debt with the idea that many consumers are disciplined and smart enough to borrow rationally. The concept of using debt to build wealth doesn't mean you should embark on a shopping spree. Fancy cars, huge homes and extravagant vacations won't lead most people to financial stability. Instead, debt is a useful tool only if you're willing to spend less than you make. Debt is risky, and in a perfect world, we would all rather avoid risk. The problem is that we do not live in a perfect world. Debt is risky, but it gets an undeservedly bad rap. Call it anti-debt hysteria. For a different perspective on how to handle borrowing, consider how companies manage their balance sheets. In the corporate realm, debt isn't evil, it's just part of life. Of course, businesses try not to become heavily indebted, but they structure their obligations in a way that maximizes both profits and financial resources. Individuals tend to carry either too little or too much debt. Approaching your personal balance sheet as if you were the chief financial officer of a company can dramatically change your perspective. Like chocolate, coffee or red wine, a little bit of debt can be a good thing, when handled responsibly. Retirement savings can fall victim to your desire to reduce debt. If you're paying off borrowings with money that otherwise could go into a retirement plan, you might be making a costly mistake. That's because of the power of compounding, money invested at age 30 or 40 can grow substantially by the time you reach retirement age. By skipping retirement contributions to pay debt, you reap the benefit of retiring debt-free, but forego the potentially larger gain of decades of compounded returns on that money. A tale of three families, the Nadas, the Steadies and the Radicals. Here's an illustration of how the shrewd use of debt can enhance your retirement security. Take three couples of the same age, each makes $120,000 a year, each takes a $300,000 interest-only mortgage on nearly identical homes, each has $30,000 annually to devote to mortgage payments and retirement savings, and each makes the same 6% return on their retirement savings. One couple, the Nadas, despises debt and spends its extra income not on retirement savings but on retiring the mortgage. The good news for them is that, after 12 years of mortgage payments of $2,500 a month, they're debt-free. Now, at age 47, they start investing the $2,500 that had gone to the mortgage into retirement savings. The Nadas reach retirement age with $1 million. 
They've seemingly taken the most responsible path, but with a return of 6%, their $1 million nest egg will yield income of just $60,000 a year, or $5,000 a month. If the very phrase intelligent use of strategic debt sounds heretical to you, you're not alone. The next couple, the steadies, is a bit more comfortable with debt. They opt to pay just $1,250 per month on their mortgage and devote the other $1,250 to retirement savings. They retire with $1.25 million, paying off their mortgage at age 65. They're a bit better off, thanks to the extra 12 years of compounded returns, but not substantially so. After retirement, their 6% return yields income of $75,000 a year, or $6,250 a month. Conventional wisdom is not only wrong with respect to investing, it is really wrong with respect to debt. The third family, the radicals, eschews conventional wisdom. Instead of aggressively paying down their mortgage, they pay only the interest on their mortgage, which costs $750 a month. They devote the other monthly $1,750 to retirement savings. This approach seems risky, but at age 65, the radicals have reaped the benefits. Their retirement nest egg is worth $1.75 million. Even after subtracting the $300,000 they still owe on their mortgage, the Radicals' account balance is worth $200,000 more than that of the Steadies and $450,000 more than that of the Nadas. And the Radicals can keep the $300,000 mortgage, the $1.75 million nest egg will throw off $8,750 in monthly income, enough to pay the $750 a month in mortgage interest while still providing a heftier income than their neighbors have. Three types of debt, good, bad and indifferent. Many consumers and investors mistakenly believe that all debt is the same. In fact, you can owe three different kinds of debt. The first, oppressive debt, is the high interest debt that Orman and Ramsey rightly detest. This debt is destructive and expensive, avoid it at all costs. Oppressive debt's double-digit interest rates impoverish the borrower. These usurious charges don't even come with a tax write-off. Money flows into every household like water through a hose. When all is well, it flows freely and abundantly. But a kink in the hose, loss of a job, a serious medical condition, even a natural disaster, could stop the flow. The second type of debt, working debt, is a necessary evil. This includes mortgages in the way most homeowners use them, low-rate student loans and small business loans. This kind of borrowing generally can be helpful to your net worth, although it's a bit costly. The advantage of working debt is that it allows you to make responsible investments you couldn't afford to pay for outright, a house when you're just starting in your career, a college education or a building for your business. This debt has a cost, but it doesn't come at the exorbitant interest rates of oppressive debt. If you haven't been storing water in cisterns, you and your family will be parched and in peril. The final category, enriching debt, belongs to a class that chief financial officers understand but that many consumers can't comprehend. This is debt you take on not because you need it but because it'll help make you wealthier. Enriching debt can include a mortgage or a loan backed by stocks. Your strategy is to invest the proceeds of the loan and make more than the cost of the debt. Say you borrow against your house with a 3% mortgage and invest the money to earn a 6% return. Even though you easily could pay off the mortgage, you choose instead to invest the money. Liquidity is another use for this kind of debt, tying up all your cash in a house leaves you debt-free but lacking flexibility in case of an emergency, such as a job loss or a health crisis. 
For many people in need of liquidity, it can be wiser to have a $500,000 house with a $300,000 mortgage than a $500,000 house with no mortgage. Whether or not debt is bad or debt is good depends on your resources relative to your needs. Any strategy using enriching debt works only if you have the discipline to save money. Try to put aside at least 10%, and ideally 15%, of your income. If you can save 20% of your wages, you'll enjoy more financial flexibility. But unless your career has a short shelf life, such as that of a professional athlete, you don't need to save more than 30% of your income. Putting away a significant chunk of your pay might seem difficult, but keep in mind that the median income in the United States is $54,000. If you earn more than that, you make more than half of all Americans. And if you're in the wealthiest half of the population, you can save some money. The four LIFE phases for investors. The typical investor goes through four life stages. Launch. In this phase, you're just starting out. Your net worth is less than half of your gross annual income. This is a financially precarious time, and your absolute mission is to avoid oppressive debt. Begin to cobble together a small cash reserve of one month's income and to set aside money for retirement. Your top priority is paying down all borrowings in full. Independence. During this stage, your net worth ranges from six months to two years of your gross annual income. Strive to avoid oppressive debt. Now that you have breathing room, build a three-month emergency fund in your checking account and add more to your retirement plan. Freedom. Your net worth is two to five times your gross annual income. During this time, you have considerable financial flexibility. Depending on where you live, renting might still make sense. Instead of paying down debt, build up savings. Equilibrium, your net worth exceeds five times your annual income. In this promised land, you can pay off all your debt, but it may not be wise to do so. The difference between saving and investing. Once you've begun to build reserves, you need to establish a clear distinction between saving and investing, which are two different concepts. Use savings to create an emergency cushion that you'll dip into in case of an unexpected outlay. Your savings aren't for splurging on vacations or making speculative investments. Your savings are a rainy day fund that protects you from ever having to take on oppressive debt. Your first goal is to build up funds in your checking and savings accounts that equal three months of living expenses. With this money, seek conservative investments that carry no risk and aim solely to match inflation. By the time you retire, try to have the equivalent of about five years of income in your conservative, low-risk, low-return bucket. So if you're making $100,000 a year, you'll want $500,000 in the conservative bucket. The enriching debt strategy would seem to depend on a bull market to be profitable. In truth, the old days of 8% and even 10% returns are a relic. Market returns are likely to underwhelm investors in the near future. Stocks did gain an average of 10.2% from 1970 through 2015. But that record tells you nothing about what stocks will do in the future, nor does it mean your particular portfolio and asset allocation yielded those results. A portfolio made up of 70% stocks and 30% bonds gives you a predictable level of risk but an uncertain potential for returns. For many people, the biggest opportunity for enriching debt comes from home equity. Tying up cash in your home creates an opportunity cost, that money isn't creating a return elsewhere. Rock bottom mortgage rates provide a golden opportunity to create a spread between what you pay to borrow and how much you make on your investments. Factor in the tax deductibility of mortgage interest, which lowers the effective cost of borrowing. 
If your mortgage rate is 4% and you're in the 33% tax bracket, your real cost of borrowing is not 4% but 2.68%. Whether your home's value appreciates or declines is irrelevant. The core portfolio. If the conservative part of your asset allocation is like a safety valve, the core portfolio is the bedrock. This is a diversified pot of money that seeks to beat inflation by about 4% per year. In a bull market, your core portfolio should be solid but not stellar. In a bear market, your core holdings shouldn't fall as much as stocks overall. This basket of investments should include U.S. and global stocks, bonds, real estate and commodities. Fill it with instruments that don't move together in lockstep. A portfolio of proper investments holds assets whose movements don't closely correlate with one another. This might seem like a bitter pill to swallow at first, but you shouldn't expect all your investments to be rising at the same time. The aggressive portfolio. How much should you put in any one speculative bet? It seems that investing 4% of your portfolio in a growth stock is the sweet spot. Assume you're right, and the investment doubles. Then your portfolio will rise by 4% a healthy outcome. But suppose you're wrong, and the investment becomes worthless. In that case, your portfolio declines by only 4%, and you live to fight another day. If you're really reaching for a big win, you may decide to devote 10% of your holdings to a single aggressive investment. A 100% gain would make your returns explode, but, by the same token, a total loss will cause your returns to implode. What about being cautious and putting just 1% of your portfolio into an aggressive bet? Don't bother. Doubling your investment will boost your overall returns by just 1%. In this case, the reward doesn't justify the risk. Aggressive investing isn't for the faint of heart. This style of speculation can bring you electrifying wins but, in all likelihood, an equal number of crushing defeats. Aggressive investing generally makes sense for two types of investors, those who are so far behind in their goals that they can't hope to reach them any other way, and those who are so far ahead of their investing goals that they won't feel the potential losses. Until your net worth is twice your annual income $200,000, if you make $100,000 a year, avoid aggressive investing altogether. Home ownership, be careful. Advice that owning a home is better than renting also may be unsound. The math makes sense only if you plan to stay in a home for five to seven years. Among the many hidden expenses of homeownership, depreciation and maintenance stand out as a cash drain. If you have a $500,000 house, you can expect to pay $10,000 to $15,000 per year just to keep the place in top shape. Property taxes add another 1% to 2%, depending on where you live. Add another 1% to 2% for closing costs when you buy, plus 5% to 6% in real estate commissions when you sell. If you own that $500,000 house for 5 years and then sell, you will have spent more than $100,000 on various costs of ownership, before accounting for mortgage interest. As for mortgages, the very loan you may think of as the riskiest is probably the wisest one to take. Interest only, adjustable rate mortgages give you the most flexibility to minimize housing costs and maximize your savings. The standard 30-year fixed rate loan isn't a terrible option, but avoid the 15-year fixed rate mortgage. The combination of low rates and a quick payoff can seem tempting, but it makes sense only if you're saving more than 20% of your income. Otherwise, the higher payment on a 15-year loan will cause you to sacrifice retirement contributions. About the author. Thomas J. Anderson, founder and chief executive of Supernova Cuz, a financial technology company, is also the author of The Value of Debt and The Value of Debt in Retirement.